guest uh, today knows that JMU uh, loves poetry. And look at this, look at this wonderful audience. I want to thank you all for being here. I especially want to thank um, all of the faculty members who encourage their students to be here. I see all my colleagues sitting up near the front, uh, uh, Professor Hood, uh, Thompson, uh, Godfrey, uh, Lee, Fatnitz, all those wonderful professors. Any other professors in the room? Oh, I got them all. <laughs> I'm Joanne Gavin, and I'm director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center. Okay, okay. Uh, my voice is always so big, so I, I usually don't need uh, this, but I will do this because uh, Jill told me to do it. <laughs> and I want you to know that uh, I couldn't do uh, what I do with Furious Flower uh, without the wonderful support of the Furious Flower staff. And um, Jill Wade, who just came up here, wave in the back, uh, Jill. Jill is our editorial program assistant, and this is really going to be her next to her last week with the Furious Flower Poetry Center. She's been with the center for three and a half years. We will not lose her to JMU. She will be going over to another department but I want you to say thank you to Jill Wade for everything she's done for Furious Flower. And I want you to meet the other members of the staff, and just because I'm going to sit down, and after I sit down, I'm just going to enjoy like you all. Uh, at the camera in the back is our um, uh, media assistant, uh, right at her post, Amber McBride, and she'll be coming up for a question and answer session at the very end after the reading. And our assistant director of the Furious Fire Poetry Center, Elizabeth Hoover. Elizabeth, wave. <laughs> she will be in front of you in the next two minutes. I would like to remind you to cut off your cell phones and your other electronic devices. There are so many people here, I want to make sure that you get to hear <coughs> the wonderful Camille Dungy. Um, I want to say welcome again to you, and especially welcome to my friend, Camille Dungy. I am so, so happy to have her back in Virginia for just a little while. The only thing I'm upset about is that she didn't bring with her her beautiful, beautiful child, Callie. I had anticipated holding her during this whole reading, but she's not here, and so, shame on you. <laughs> but she's been a long time gone, long time yet to come, kind of thinking about one of her poems. So I'm glad you're back here in Virginia. And I, I know you're just going to be uh, just thrilled with this reading. And I want you to understand that after the reading, uh, there will be a short question and answer period. So get your questions ready. I want to introduce you to Elizabeth Hoover again, who will do the formal introduction of our speaker. Let's welcome her. Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to introduce Camille Dungy. Um, she's a poet I've admired um, for quite some time. Um, but I really developed my literary crush on her when I was reading her introduction to Black Nature, which is an anthology of African-American nature poetry. And it's a really radical book um, because for too long, uh, the voices of people of color have been excluded from narratives about nature poetry. And I think it's also a really radical book because I think the environmental movement and the sustainability movement uh, needs to do more to engage with the issue of race. Uh, but I was reading her introduction and she talks about moving from Lynchburg to Boston and how one of the things she noticed is that she stopped walking and the people weren't walking. And this is something I really related to, having moved from a place where people kind of walk everywhere, where, you know, a half hour walk is considered to be a short walk. Um, uh, 
what I realized as I was reading her introduction, it, this wasn't the type of walking she was talking about. Because we walk in a hurry, and we walk on our cell phones. We walk while looking at our cell phones. Um, sometimes I walk uh, while, while reading a book, uh, in fact. Uh, the walking that uh, Dungy writes about is a walking that permits a profound engagement with the physical world. And it's the kind of uh, walking that can be both radical and transformative. Um, it's through this willingness to engage that she discovers this beautiful tree uh, growing in a park. Um, and it, in an effort to learn about the tree, she learns that the tree is growing from um, the site of a former public swimming pool. And the pool was filled in uh, because the city would rather fill in the pool and close it than integrate it. Um, and true to form, of a poet, it's a really complicated story because on one hand, it exposes this um, horrible racial history, but on the other hand, you still have a really gorgeous tree. Um, and in reading her uh, book, Smith Blue, which won the Crab Orchard <laughs> Prize, sorry, I didn't write that down, Crab Orchard Prize in uh, 2010, um, you really see that uh, Dungy's writing reminds us that great poetry and great literature can just start by simply looking. In fact, the first section of uh, Black Nature is just called Just Looking. Um, and in her book, it's through her craft and her restraint that she transforms the simple <coughs> act of noticing into really challenging, rich, and complex poetry. When I was um, uh, researching for this, uh, introduction, I kept reading reviews of Smith Blue that referred to it as a survival guide. And I think it is indeed a survival guide, but there's so much more than just survival that is possible in that book. It's uh, so much as possible for me as an artist and as a person who cares about the natural world and a person who just uh, cares about environmental justice. Uh, but the first thing you have to do is look up. And I noticed this temptation to do some like, really like horrible faux pas after I finished Smith Blue, because I was walking from my office up the hill, and every time I passed someone on a cell phone, I just wanted to lean down and say, look up. <laughs> Welcome, Camille Dungeon. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, JMU, and everybody <coughs> who makes the Furious Flower Poetry Center possible. You guys may not know what an absolute treasure you have. I don't mind being circled. Well, when you say it like that, <laughs> it sounds more intense. Or I could back up a little bit and then, yeah, let's do that. And they don't have to look at my back, which is nice. I have a nice back. But how's that? Now, is that too far from your camera? You can sit on the floor at my feet like I'm Alan Ginsberg or something. There's one more chair over there. Someone grab that chair. So, I had so many ways that I wanted to start this reading. And then Dr. Gavin made me go with route number 14. <laughs> I was gonna bring my daughter on this trip because she's three and a half now and she travels with me a lot on my reading tours. So she's a, she's a good little uh, world traveler. Um, she is about 4,000 miles short of her first frequent flyer award <laughs> at three and a half. Um, so she was going to come with me, but we just moved from, from California to Colorado, and my parents have not seen our new house. And my parents are those kinds of retirees who are so busy that they just don't have, they just don't have a free week, right? So they had a free week, and I said, well, that's great, but I'm going to be in Virginia and D.C., and Kelly was going to come with me, and my mother forbade it. It's, not, it's just not allowed. She only has one grandchild. And that grandchild was going to be in her new room in her house so she could see it. And she didn't care about me. You know, you come back whenever you manage. But that kid has to be at home. So, sorry, Dr. Dunchy won out. <laughs> but I thought I would, bring, I would bring her into the room a little bit. And um, 
and tell you a little story too. I have a, a lot of family history in Virginia, actually. My, um, my grandparents moved here in the early 1940s and stayed until the mid-1950s and left in 1953. They came here because my grandmother's uncle was a chemistry professor at Virginia Seminary in Lynchburg, Virginia, and he got another better job offer at Grambling and wanted to leave, but they wouldn't let him out of his contract unless he found somebody to fill his position. And so his new nephew-in-law had just graduated with a PhD, and he said, I know someone. And my grandparents came and moved to Lynchburg. So there was this original history. My mother and aunt were actually born in Lynchburg. And then they went away, and 40 years later, I returned. And a lot had changed in the town, and a lot had not. And I really owe a great deal of my becoming the kind of poet that I am to landing in a place where I had a lot of history that I was very detached from. And as Elizabeth says, it's kind of walking around and looking around. A, a great deal of what we do as poets is ask questions. And so I just kept asking, what's what's the situation with the history here? And, and how is it that I found this place in the way that it is? So I'll tell you a little story, for instance, of my grandmother um, deciding that she wanted to try and integrate a church on Rivermont Avenue in um, Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, there is a mention in this poem of a, uh, of a girl in Topeka, Kansas, and that is the girl who's at the center of Brown versus the Board of Education, which is a little Supreme Court case you, I hopefully, know a little bit about. The poem is called, My Grandmother Takes the Youth Group to Services. The skies wide open blue told her, go in where you've never been before. And where she went, she took the children, older girls in long skirts, little black heels, white collars rough with starch, and hair still hot from the comb, along with boys their age, pants creased, shoes blacked and bright. Little Linda in Topeka had upset no one yet, but that black shock Lynchburg's largest high school class in years did. Surprised, the white minister welcomed her with silence. But that evening, his voice fumed through Thornton's phone. Your pretty wife should trust the good Lord's plan. Let her know, in heaven, Negroes will have to learn their rightful place. I tried to go to that church myself, like 45 years later. I'm a good Presbyterian, I thought I'd, I'll, I'll try it out. And in the middle of a sermon about how we did not have free will, which is in fact true Presbyterian doctrine, I, I got this ridiculous coughing fit. I just could not cough and I couldn't find any mint or anything. And so I had to leave the room and I thought, I don't know if that was free will or what, but <laughs> generations of uh, incompatibility with that particular structure. Um, so, so you might gather that I had this, this um, affection and connection to these grandparents. And so when I had the first great-grandchild, I decided to name her after my grandmother. And um, we were able to visit quite frequently, actually, uh, before my grandmother passed. And I happened to be home to speak at my old high school. They invited me back for the graduation as the distinguished alumni speaker. So I came back for that trip and uh, grandmother, my mother told me, grandmother's not doing so well, you should be prepared. And she told me that for like 10 years, I've been hearing that, you know? And I go back and grandma's all perky when I'm there and she's all happy and then the day after I leave, she'd crash again, but she would perk up for me and especially once little Callie came along. Well, I walked into the room on this visit and she, she didn't even open her eyes. She just lay there and I thought, oh, Mother might be right. Um, and I told her I was there, and she told me that I should practice my speech for her. 
And the last conversation I ever had, a full conversation with my grandmother, was her critiquing my oration. <laughs> and uh, telling me that I should be more precise when I said the word you in a poem. I feel like with that kind of intro, I should probably read the poem, right? Um, and so that was the last conversation, and I went off and gave my speech, and the speech is called, or the poem is called, The Preacher's Wife Speaks at the Dunbar High School Commencement. You are the crop that grows wild tall, that wicked brambled twists up, around, and over the lean poles grounding you. The plants that shoot and swing in their eager, budding, lanky way, you sway up, bright and juiceful. <coughs> Sweet you, bright worlds, globed and green, in such ways as I have seen, and others I have not. Sometimes in words like rich, soiled plots. You are the bountiful crop. So that's the kind of thing that that woman told me. And she also taught me a lot of rhymes and uh, poems that linger with me. Like um, one to help you remember your gospels. Some of you might know it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four posts my bed rests on. One to watch and one to pray and two to bear my soul away. So that night, when I came home from giving the oration, I sat by the bed and recited some of the many poems that my grandmother had taught me. And that was one of them. And from that, I take the title of this next poem I'm going to read. One to watch and one to pray. We passed the baby over the bed. And later, we passed tissue and her Bible with its onion skin pages, its highlighted lessons and dog-eared parables she kept handy with bookmarks whose tassels hung and swayed as her hair might have done when she was very sweet and very young. And when we had finished what reading we would read, we stopped a little while to register the pleasant song the woman on the stereo was singing and then the baby cried for milk. And so we passed her back across the bed, which is when someone asked if there was any more water, and we passed the water over her lips with the swab the nurses gave us just for this, a square pink bubblegum lollipop looking deal, like the treats she used to give us when we were very sweet and very young. And someone came with roses, and though we smelled the flowers because we hoped for something better than the smell that lingered all around us. Hothouse flowers look alive long after their lively smells have faded. So when someone came in with cards, we passed the cards and flowers over the bed and stood them up with the other cards and flowers on the little stand of white plastic and chrome that passed as a bedside table in that place. And when a friend came in who hadn't met the baby, we passed the baby over the bed. And the friend said, she's so sweet. And when a cousin came who knew things few of us knew, we listened to stories from when both of them were very young. And when someone cried, we passed the tissue over the bed. And when someone said, she's so small now, we remembered the pink square bubblegum lollipop swab. And when the nurse said, you could tell by how she breathes, Someone got the Bible from the little chrome and plastic stand. And when someone said, it's okay to leave, we didn't want to do a thing. And though several days later, someone told me people somewhere in West Africa pass a baby over the bed of a dying person to say there will always be new bodies to celebrate and mourn, that night, we only knew the baby needed a change, and someone had to take her, 
And so we passed the baby over the bed and decided who would stay to watch her go. So while I'm on that kind of role about writing about witnessing, writing what it is that we see, even hard things that we see, I'll, I'll um, honor a request for a poem. Uh, this, is, this is also from my first book. Uh, and the incident really did happen. And after, after we witnessed this experience, my friend I was with <coughs> said, you're the poet. You have to write this down. Um, and that really is so often what our charge is, right, as poets, to be the witnesses, to be the ones who can articulate the thing that we saw, but we're not reporters. And so the next trick comes in figuring out how to describe it in a way that gives it life and beauty again, and reinvigorates and essentially reanimates the scene that you're describing. So I worked for about honestly about 18 months trying to figure out a way into this poem. And this is what finally came. Requiem. Sing the mass. Light upon me washing words now that I am gone. The sky was a hot blue sheet. The summer breeze fanned out and over the town. I could have lived forever under that sky. Forgetting where I was, I looked left, not right, crossed into a street, and stepped in front of the bus that ended me. Will you believe me when I tell you it was beautiful? My left leg turned to uselessness and my right shoe flung some distance down the road. Will you believe me when I tell you I had never been so in love with anyone as I was then with everyone I saw? The way an age-worn man held his wife's shaking arm, supporting the weight that seemed to sing from the heart she clutched. Knowing her eyes embraced the pile that was me, he guided her sacked body through the crowd. And the way one woman began a fast the moment she looked under the wheel. I saw her swear off decadence. I saw her start to pray. You see, I was so beautiful. The woman sent to clean the street used words like police tape to keep back a young boy seconds before he rounded the grisly bumper. The woman who cordoned the area feared my memory would fly him through the world on pinions of passion, much as, later, the sight of my awful beauty pulled her down to tears when she pooled my blood with water and swiftly, swiftly washed my stains away. creating my segues right. perfectly. So I wrote that book, What to Eat, What to Drink, What to Leave for Poison, and uh, I thought, well, gosh, now I've written a book of poetry, now what? That's scary. You know, the first book is, is a scary process. The second book is a terrifying process. Because now, you know, a few people are looking at you, for one thing. Um, and secondly, you just, you know, you kind of, you've done this thing that seemed almost impossible and you manage it but then you think if it was so almost impossible is it something I can recreate again and do it again and so here I'm faced with a second book trauma I got an uh, NEA fellowship and so that was helpful and I took a semester off I was teaching down at Randolph making women's college that's what got me down there I took a semester off and I I went traveling um, and I spent a month in Ghana 
in West Africa and visited the slave castles there, and it was an overwhelming experience, one which I'm actually only now finally being able to enter into writing about a decade and another trip, actually five trips back to the continent later, <coughs> I can finally talk about what it's like to stand in a slave castle where most of the black people who came from British colonies entered through the doors. Um, so sometimes I talk all about witnessing. It takes a long time sometimes to figure out how to manage. But what happened was I came back to Virginia where, I've been talking about my maternal family, the Dungey family name is a, a Virginia name um, as it relates to black people in America. And so, in fact, returning to Virginia is always doubly returning home for me in many ways. And so as I had wandered around looking at what it meant, the history as it related to my mother's family, I started thinking about the history as it related to my father's family. But I have no documented evidence on this. Um, this was all imagination. And so I started creating characters and uh, building stories around invented characters who came out of a lot of research. Um, and one of the first characters who came to me was a, was a young woman named Molly, who was a real free spirit, even though she's not a free person. And she finds ways of manifesting that freedom in um, engaging and um, risky ways. I read this poem, the other reason I wanted to read this is that I read this poem at the last Furious Flower Conference. The next one's coming up soon, and it's exciting. <laughs> um, every decade, your, your university hosts one of, the, one of the world's most important conferences of African American poetry and poetics. And uh, I was a, a, a tiny tot the first decade, and so I didn't go. In the second decade, I was a budding poet with no book. And, and now look, life changes over time, right? Anyway, this is not, it's not about me now, it's about Molly. So, um, so I, I was just saying, I did all this research, and, and sometimes the research just, it just, I just came up with great words. And I just would try and find poems that would allow me to use these words, these fun 19th century ideas and objects and words. So this poem really is just, it's a vessel for stuff that I picked up in my research. She liked the moving things best. Molly didn't sleep the night she borrowed Master Fink's eye. She knelt by the flat rock near her hold hole, her belongings all around, and sent the glass eye clacking toward the marbles, bumping the dice, wobbling for hours the same direction the little blue ball rolled. Molly couldn't help but be a little pleased by her courage, showing the missus's father's eye these things of hers, the thimble, the silver fork, Miss Amy called it an oyster fork when the set came up one short. The black buttons, the mini strings and ribbons, the brass cufflinks, the tiny glass vase. Shad thought the collar button of his only buttoning shirt had fallen off of its own accord. He believed Molly lost the pebbles and ribbons, the tokens he gave her thought she had too much on her mind most hours, couldn't keep track of it all. Shad thought Molly wanted the same things he wanted, an arm crook to rest in before the conch call, a thigh leaning against another's through the nighttime meal. But Molly buried the things she liked best, the pinwheel little Master Rufus left out in the yard, the red and yellow marbles, the spinning top. So that's a little taste of Molly. You wanna hear what, her, what Shad thinks about Molly? I, I'm gonna tell you anyway. You gotta work on that. Like we, we frequently we ask rhetorical questions and we're gonna do whatever, whatever it is we wanna do. It disempowers you, the question and, ask her and the answer. So you just cut that out. Taming Shad. Two things he didn't understand. Even after she let him pull her up into the wide hug of the sycamore branches, and after she took 
to tying her hair in red ribbons he used Sunday wages to buy for her. What had Molly's little nod meant that first day her body, a blue bag gripped in one hand, ran across his shadow? Laundry day, so she was busy, but something made her take time to answer a question he hadn't realized he'd already asked. That was one thing he couldn't understand. What made her nod yes? to a dusty bruise of a man just walked up to the Jackson place after how long trotting behind his newest master of his master's paint. The other thing was why, after all those nights studying the creases in his thumbs, the lobes of his ears, the direction sweat took running off his belly, she stayed away from him until the morning glories that had sprung open in his eyes closed again. Did she have to remind him, wasn't nothing to be seen that he could look after? And then one more poem from this book. It's a beautiful flight in from Dulles on a nice September day fly over all the corn and tobacco fields and the leaves are just starting to change. This is a really beautiful state, just, just saying. Survival. The body winnows, the body tills. The body knows, sow's feet, sow gut, night harvested kale. The body knows to sleep through welted dreams, to wake before the night succumbs to morning. Wheat, wheat, tobacco, corn, the body knows. No stopping, no sinking down. Like a branch floats on water, the body does not go under. Like a tree seated among dark rocks, the body leans where it must or fails. I'm gonna read a poem by Not Me. Because one of the other things that I do a lot, besides writing and teaching and mothering and wifing, um, and I also make a really yummy salad, is I edit. Um, I've, I've edited three anthologies, and um, it's a great joy to have this opportunity to bring work by other writers out to the forefront. So as Elizabeth acknowledged, when I published Black Nature, there was no other collection of African American nature poetry in existence. Um, and actually very little representation of writers of color in nature anthologies and journals and things at all. Um, I, we talk sometimes about books being major interventions in uh, literature and um, all I can say is that after the publication of Black Nature in 2009, the next three major publications of eco-poetics and nature poetry had five times as many writers of color <laughs> included in them than had existed in the books before. And so it's really exciting to be part of a new budding awareness for who writes about nature and how. Um, and so the poem that I just wrote, read before, Survival, I would think of that in many ways as a nature poem. It's talking about how people interacted with the world, people who were brought here to interact with the natural world and how they did it and what that meant. It's not about an idyllic tramp out into the wilderness to discover <laughs> oneself and their peace and inner spirit, which is how we often think about nature writing. Um, it's a poem that is significantly more charged um, and full of a kind of commentary on our complicity for how we're treating the world and how we're treating other people. And so all that is an introduction to a poem by Lucille Clifton, who is one of the poets I was most delighted to be able to talk about and, and feature in this collection. In fact, I kind of cheated. Um, the maximum number of poet, poems any poet should have in this book was four, just for fairness sake. But I used a, a Clifton poem as the preface too, so she got five. <laughs> Generations. People who are going to be, in a few years, bottoms of trees, 
bear a responsibility to something besides people. If it was only you and me sharing the consequences, it would be different. It would be just generations of men. But this business of war, these war kinds of things, are erasing those natural, obedient generations who ignored pride, stood on no high legs, <coughs> begged no water, stole no bread, did their own things. And the generations of rice, of coal, of grasshoppers, by their invisibility, denounce us. Many claps for Mr. Seal Clifton. I'm going up uh, on Monday, actually, up to DC to read at a Boulder Library um, and Poetry Society sponsored event, and I get to talk to all the people of DC about how amazing the Seal Clifton is. <laughs> so I'm going to honor another request, and this poem, it's, it's a ride. Just, just come with me. It's a five part poem. Um, it, if you're taking creative writing classes at all, I'm sure you've heard the dictum that you need to explore all the senses. And uh, if you've heard me at all today, you might have heard one of the things that I like to do is just follow things to their exhaustion point um, and see what the exploration does. And so this is a poem in which I explore all the senses to um, the extreme. Five for truth. One. Maybe you, too, have heard something, but haven't seen the thing, wondered longer for a moment at a sound that sounds like the moan of a man losing his spleen to a gull's beak. It is likely only a bull seal reporting to his neighbors, but you know something of seals. Imagine the sailor who, in 1682, saw his first seal its bloat and bob and doggish float, so like and unlike a waterlogged man's, drew up a body to buoy the sound of his shipwrecked fears. Once, two hours past midnight and three continents from home, I heard a wild boar rooting just outside my camp. Certainly, we all have heard something we haven't seen, and the hearing which should have been an answer, has become a question instead. It's wood cracking. Under what weight? It's a rock sliding. Where? Two. The old man has mistaken his niece for his sister. And would you fault his memory, its vision? Are you the lone one who has never confused one face with another's name? But it was you, remember, who mistook the other black girl for the one your friend said you should get to know. And it was you, or someone quite like you in appearance, who, thinking he was somebody famous, positioned yourself beside that no one on the train. These misperceptions are nothing that hasn't happened before. You've heard, perhaps, of the masseuse who gained his sight at 50. Everything he'd known in blindness turned into something slightly horrible with sight. His cat, his dog, the animals he loved, the stiff or swollen limbs of clients, all these were varied, textured, wonderful beneath his fingers, but hardly differentiable now before his unaccustomed eyes. Three, I have never been afraid of water. And yet, I am always a little afraid of what might be floating in it. Take stingrays, take leeches, take sharks. Take my friend who, on the beach at age four, found a pretty thing to play with, a Portuguese man of war. My fear is the fear of his mother seeing her son, his mouth almost inside the luminous jelly. Certain fear touches us like that, leaving only the taste of its skin on our tongue. Who isn't afraid of being the one disaster touches? They say it's normal, 
but the way lately if I pull the skin along my clavicle, it folds easily and brings with it all that loose flesh. This is mostly all I have to worry and be glad about, feeling my own body growing old. Four, when gambling your senses, weighed your taste. You'd still have touch, so you would know what textures you chewed. You'd have sight. Like Johnny Carson, who had no taste, you'd still have your lips, your American teeth, even probably your tongue. Life is a chain of compensations. My friend who drinks and smokes and snorts the occasional powdered drug says she'll throw herself from the top of a Mayan temple when a cancer settles in. I've seen this friend gash her forehead on the fan hung over a bar she danced on and watched her keep dancing through the end of her tequila and two songs. I wonder if my friend knows at which stage of her ruin exactly she plans to let herself fly. Five. One thing I like about the nose is how it lacks imagination. Just last night, I woke up dreaming of a body in the forest. No one I recognized. Maggots busily erasing the flesh around her nostrils, her impossibly <coughs> twisted arm. Or was it alongside a road, her body? Where are we turning up dead girls these days? fruit in her hand. Though I would not, it was so ripe it seemed a shame not to taste it. I could feel the moss she rested in springing up after my discovering feet had passed. I could imagine hearing how she caterwauled in terror. In my bed last night, I woke up afraid to touch her because I knew how she would feel and I wanted nothing to do with that feeling. One thing I don't like about the imagination is how it can turn against me when I let it go. Let me, now please, bless my nose, the least creative of my organs, because you are in this way a failure. The smell of her terror was not this morning in my bed. Bless you for not pretending to know a thing you haven't. Bless you. I think I'm going to read one more. And then I'm going to answer questions. So I talked a little bit about I wrote my first book, and that was this thing. And the first book was a series of sonnets. That was, that was one of the constraints that made it possible for me to write that book. You, so you put these little pins around yourself, and, and it's a thing that you can achieve. OK, I managed 14 lines, 10 syllables per line. I got a volta right at the right place. Nice little argument. We're, we're good. I did it. You know, it's like. It's a thing that you can accomplish. So there's 52 sonnets in that book, mostly persona poems about people I knew. And so part of the deal with the second book was I like, did not want to write a sonnet. And I didn't want to write about someone like my grandma who could correct me, you know, about what it was. And so I made the people up. I went to an entirely different century. I wrote these long, long poems, so long that my press had to create a, an outside book for me so that the characters could run away you know, in their lines. They were pinned in enough, right? They needed some freedom. Um, but I knew that that book was finished when I, when I wrote a series of three sonnets. But then I'd stopped running away from the sonnet. The sonnet stopped being a scary thing. Um, so the other thing that was happening was I, I was writing poems about really difficult situations and stress and trauma and, and things that sort of didn't necessarily end up well for the people and, and human relationships that were all full of tension and and, and general unhappiness. Um, and so I realized that I was onto something kind of new 
when I started writing these poems in my third book that were actually resolved love poems. It works out okay. Not to say there's not a little struggle along the path, but it works out okay. So I think I tell you that big long story just to say that the things that are the biggest challenges to you in your writing are quite often going to be the things that are going to, to garner the greatest rewards. If you just keep writing into them and you face them down and you, and you accept your fears and you think about why it is that you're afraid of them, and keep trying. Sometimes it works out. It's true for love too. This uh, title for this poem comes from a jazz standard, The Man I Love. Maybe Tuesday will be my good news day. Fireflies flaring flatted fists. I'm tuning up on the picket fence. One moment, an empty bell. One moment, a rubber mute. I've practiced, so I know what comes next. The night offers this much and not an F more. One, then one, then two. Belfry rats could be blowing bebop for all I care. Asymmetry is obsolete, gone, 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 gone. Fire in the fire pit, the smoke catches in his hair. The rest of the boys go on without me. Though, if I wanted to chase them, I could breathe clear from the base of my belly and blow. This isn't as complicated as it sounds. Nor are those cats in the alley scatting. I'm all tuned up and off the fence. His solo is over and I've practiced so I know what comes next. One, then one, then two. Thank you. Um, and that the, the key was to write it as an empathetically and truthfully as possible, whether it was my story or an appropriated story. With the sonnets, as you might have heard from my patter in between, and as you're hearing from this answer, I can go on. You know, I can just talk for a really long time. And um, so the sonnet was this constraint that allowed me, forced me to figure out what the most important thing was that that poem needed to say. It just forced me to the heat, to the, to the oven of the poem. And not all those sort of extraneous kitchen trappings around, right? But like the thing that's where the cooking happened. Uh, and, and so that, that 14 line constraint, which sometimes I, you know, sometimes I cheated and would do a 28 line or a crown of sonnets, um, but that constraint forced me into really figuring out what my point was. And, and that's, you know, continues to be an issue for me. And so it was helpful. Like, with the five for truth, it's a, long, it's a much, much longer poem, but then I had this constraint. I'm not just talking, I am talking about my travels. I am talking about friends I have. I am talking about all these things, but how can I connect that to what our experience of the world is through our senses, right? So anytime I create a constraint, it's just, it's a way of helping me stay on task and helping my reader know what the task is. Yes. Okay, so um, first of all, I love this quote. Thank lot. you. Um, I love every um, poem in this book, but my favorite is going to carry on. My favorite line in this book is, um, my li or life is a chain of compensation. It's in five for truth. And I tried to express my love for that line to somebody else, and they told me it was bullshit. And so I would like you to explain to me how I, so I can be iterated. <laughs> <laughs> Did you then sit and force them to read the whole poem? No, because they're a math major like me. And they oh, no, 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 no. Like you, you just said a math major like you. Yeah, but I feel like I'm a different math <laughs> You know what, at its, at its, at its um, highest state, math is, math is philosophy and art at its most pure state. Um, you know, I, I think that I, this is just what I think. I think that I live in Colorado now, which is great, and I have a lovely house, and I've got a really interesting job, and my husband has an interesting job, and you know, 
live anymore in a place where this ranks in the top 10 murder capitals of the world, and so it's better for my daughter, and so that's all really good, but Lord, do I really miss California. You know, I really do. I don't live in Virginia anymore, that's good or bad, but gosh, it's really pretty here in September. But, you know, I mean, that's just all, but I, I decided to eat at Five Guys Burgers and Fries on the way in Dulles, and you know, then Elizabeth offered me a really nice quiche and salad, which probably would have been better. <laughs> but then I got to rest in the room instead of having to, you know, I mean, that's just life, that life is a chain of conversations, it's the truth, it's just the truth. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Make one decision, and then you can't make others. It's just a fact. Um, in a prayer for P with the acrostic in the poem, do you have any more poems that have acrostics? And when did you get that idea? Like, what 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 was your reason behind? That? Yeah, talk about pushing something to its extreme. <laughs> just finding a constraint, and deciding to do it. I got the idea. I was with um, I was in New York City, and I went to some opera thing with the, this, the two great poets, Wendy Walters and Tracy K. Smith. Before she was Tracy K. Smith, she was just like Tracy K. Smith. <laughs> now it's like Tracy K. Smith, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, and a, another good friend of mine, Vanessa um, Holden, actually, and uh, we, we saw this thing and they, they did the opera. Like they said something like, this opera is based on a acrostic of, of a poem by Keats. So I was like, how does it even work? What does that mean? And it wasn't really deeply explained, but I just thought I'm gonna try and write acrostic poems. And I challenged all of them to do it too. And they were like, whatever. <laughs> Imagine the size of the poem serve TKS that does that, right? But anyway, so we all thought that this would be, oh, I thought it'd be an interesting idea and, and um, challenge them and they did take me up on it. But I did it anyway. And I, but, so then what I discovered first was that if I was going to do a acrostic by every letter in the word, that <laughs> they probably didn't want a really long poem. So, um, so then I was, was looking at short poems, and very frequently the short poems that we get in English are translations from Japanese, sometimes from German. Um, there's, other, there's other languages that use epigrammatic kind of shorter poems significantly more than English does. But then I had this trouble of trying to figure out, well, if I'm doing a translation, whose translation do I use, right? Whose English do I use? This is a long story. All is to say for like a year and a half, I'm fiddling around with what to do with that Wilka poem and how do I deal with that Basha poem and what, and it just failed over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and then uh, my friend Famous died and I was angry and sad and feeling somewhat culpable and lonely and all these mix of feelings that were going and I can't go on as we do. Like how do you write a poem that's full of that many emotions? At the same time, I was playing this acrostic form and I just was sitting down on what I call Blake Page Day, just thinking, okay, I'm gonna write an acrostic poem, let me find one, let me, oh look, there's a, a new Kavafi translation. That would be kind of interesting. Let me read that. And I found this poem, Prayer. And I started writing. I was just doing an acrostic exercise. I wasn't writing an elegy to Fabus in, as I began. And by line four, it became very clear that I was writing an acrostic for Fabus and that this vessel of having to be forced back to the beginning of the line and having a particular letter that I had to come, the line had to come back around to was allowing me again the container for all of these really mixed and loud and rambunctious emotions that I was having around her loss. And so again, the, 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 the vessel was really important, and the vessel was constraint. It's a longer poem than my, than my sonnets were, um, but that constraint happened. But I think one of the most important things that I want you to pick up from that was it wasn't necessarily that I sat down and said, I'm gonna write an acrostic that is an elegy. I was actually just playing with the form. I was really just running scales and just like exercising as a poet and playing with this form just to see where I could take it. And it just happened at that moment that inspiration matched the perspiration part and something came of it. You have great answers, so that's a wonderful answer. <laughs> Thank you. I see people are scurrying out. Do we need to do like one or two more and then? That's, that would be good. Someone has a burning question. Yes. yes. 
Oh, see, we have two. Okay, so we'll start at the front and then back. What do you think the best exercises for inspiring the is? Sit your butt down at the desk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the first. <laughs> most important thing. Um, and read a lot. And then I think the most important exercise for a young writer is actually imitation. Find, in your reading, find writers you admire and just pretend to be them. Type their poem out, notice where their lines break, where their periods are, how they, they structure their sentence, and then write a imagined poem where you plug your verb where they had a verb and you plug your noun in where they had a noun in. You're not going to write their poem. Um, but, you know, just think about the fact that Picasso could have had a very promising career in the Red Lab Forger. Um, and we don't think of Picasso as a person who does those kinds of Rembrandt style still life, capturing light kind of paintings. We think of him as a completely different person. The reason he was able to take the body apart as well as he took it apart was that he really, really, really copied the old masters who figured out finally for the first time in Europe how to put the body together. Right? Um, and so copying the people that, that we aspire to just gives us more tools for figuring out who it is that we can. Um, so I'm in uh, Professor Facknett's uh, Sustainable Muse class, and I just kind of wanted to give a quick intro before my question, because I think it'll make more sense to everyone. Um, we first read a, a lot of um, The Black Nature, and then we went into reading Smith Blue. Um, so we have sort of nature on our minds the entire time we're reading um, up to this book. And the poem that sort of stuck out most to me was Association Copy, just because it is so not nature related um, but for some reason I took to this poem more than any of the others and I guess I this is more of a personal question but I'd just like to sort of keep hearing you talk what <laughs> you know, where does that sort of come from I, I don't know really where my question lies but <laughs> you know now that I've edited black nature and have become known as Black Nature Girl. <laughs> uh, I get a lot of questions about, you know, what makes you a black, uh, what, no. Well, they, I get those too. What makes you a black writer? What, what, is, what is African American poetry? And then the other is what makes you a woman writer? And another one is what makes you a nature writer? And then the other thing that I write about is history a lot. And so then that's the other question. And, you know, I get kind of bored with those questions and those categories. It's like the, 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 the general fact is, that I'm a writer, which means that I'm just deeply curious about the world. I'm a three-year-old now. She asks why all the time, and I'm like, why is like somebody else in the house? <laughs> <laughs> with me, you know? I'm not one of the parents that's annoyed by the white face. I think it's fantastic. Um, and so the poems in Smith Blue are really are about survival. They're about the different ways that we learn to cope and manage in the world that actually turns out to be what I seem to write about a lot. Um, and so some of it has to do with the world that is full of environmental degradation and, and our culpability in it and how we might be able to change that and how we might redirect that. But some of it has to do with war and um, the, the practices that we have that, that kill and maim people and um, abroad and at home and in our own homes, right? Um, and, and those are connected and not connected. And so association company it was, it's, it's again, it's, it's like a failed love poem, right? Like that one really didn't work out, that relationship. But, but it was about this, this love affair that I had with this poet and the love affair I was trying to have with this guy and the, the stinginess that we can have with each other when we have gifts to share with each other. But then also the unexpected generosity that we can show for each other. And so, in many ways, that has a lot to do with eco-poetics, the stinginess, the way that we're treating the world, and then also the unexpected things that we do that are really trying to reverse <coughs> those trends, right? I, I don't see that those have to be contradictory when we talk about people and the way people interact and when we talk about how we talk about deal with the world, but when we talk about history and the way that people historically interact and the way that we do in a contemporary sense. I think that these things can operate simultaneously. You know, 
the great Walt Whitman, I am large, I contain multitudes. I think that's the greatest way to describe what a poet is and can do. But I think that we could all do that. It's just that the poets, we're not afraid to do it. 